everybody. Welcome to uh, our lesson number six in Leadership Lessons for Women and Girls, Strength Has No Gender. For our lesson this uh, time, it's What Does Success Look Like Today? So we're trying to give you some effective and practical time management tips for balancing your lives and the lives of busy women and girls like yourself. Um, we've all heard that myth growing up about the woman who brings home the bacon she fries it up in the pan and she basically does everything but why and how has that become the definition of what it means to be a successful woman in fact studies have shown that women disproportionately carry the heavier load when it comes to the household whether that's maintaining the home through cooking and cleaning or whether it's actual child rearing but even women who don't have children report feeling and experiencing burnout. So today we're talking about achieving balance, not necessarily meeting the world's definition of success, but your own definition of success so you can have that balance in your life for your happiness and for you to feel that you are successful. So before I introduce you to our amazing panelists, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what Girls Rule the Law is. Girls Rule the Law is a 501c3 nonprofit um, corporation. What we do is we have one mission and one mission only, and that is to introduce middle and high school girls, particularly underprivileged ones, underrepresented girls, to the law. And by the law, we mean the legal field, so they could become lawyers, the legislature, so they can become legislators and, and Congress people and senators, and also judges, because we are severely underrepresented in those fields. And we do that by going into the schools. We have mock trial and debate. We set up law classes and clubs. We do after school programming, which is what you see on your screen. But we do other things as well. We have youth conferences, which are all day events. We bring in legislators on your screen. You're seeing council women and New York assembly women and senators. And we talk, we have judges on the screen and we bring them in and have them speak to our girls about their experiences and how they got to where they are. What did they have to do to meet their definition of success? And we also have what we call the Law Suits You. The Law Suits You is a wonderful program that we started. And what we do is we provide professional wear for girls to wear to mock trials and debate, which is what you're seeing on your screen, but also to girls who are starting new jobs, who have internships that they're going to, who have interviews, and who may not know how to dress, where to get those clothes, and we help them with that. So um, now, with the introduction of our wonderful ladies, uh, well, before I do that, let me tell you a little bit also about the programs that we do. We have targeted legal lessons in the schools. We have partnerships. We have sister schools that we go into and we teach. So we our program is an all volunteer program. All of our staff, myself, we're all volunteers. And what we do is because we're volunteers, we can spread ourselves out and ask women to join us as volunteers. And they go into these schools and they teach targeted lessons. We have the wonderful Mercedes Colwin from Gordon Reese who taught labor and employment at Cathedral High School. We had several women from um, the New York State Bar Association's Entertainment Law um, section who did it as a group, and they taught uh, entertainment law contracts, that sort of thing. And we're able to do that. And if you, and there's any women out there who are listening, who are participating today, you want to be a volunteer, please reach out to me, um, Mirna, M-I-R-N-A, at girlsrulethelaw.org. So now let's talk about our wonderful panelists. We have three excellent women here today. We have the Honorable Edwina Francis Martin, who is the Commissioner and Public Administrator for Richmond County. We have uh, Brenda Dorsett Bowling, who is a claims officer at Ironshore Insurance Company. And we have Mindy Sanchez, Senior Associate General Counsel at the Charlotte Mecklenburg School District out of North Carolina. Um, Winnie. Edwina Francis Martin, who I will be repeatedly calling Winnie, graduated from New York University of uh, School of Law and holds her BA in Art History from Williams College. She began her career serving as a law clerk to the Honorable Lawrence W. Pierce in the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. She is a public interest lawyer experienced in public policy, government relations, nonprofit management, and strategic communications. She served as Deputy Chief of Staff for New York City Councilwoman Debbie Rose, uh, Director of Government Relations, Communications, and Pro Bono for Legal Services in NYC. Uh, she was a litigation associate with the law firms of Sherman Sterling, Herrick, uh, 
Feinstein and Van Leer Burns and Bassett, and she volunteers extensively within her home community and the New York legal community, which is how I met Winnie through the New York State Bar Association. Our next panelist is Brenda Dorsett Bowling, and I also met Brenda several, it feels like lifetimes ago, and we worked together as in-house counsel uh, for an insurance company, but she received her Juris Doctor degree from the University of Virginia School of Law and her Bachelor of Arts degree, cum laude, from the State University of New York at Binghamton. Prior to joining Iron Shore, Brenda was in private practice where she was an associate with an insurance defense firm and was an in-house associate trial attorney for an insurance company. She is admitted to the bar in New York State, <coughs> active member of the New York State Bar Association. She currently serves on two committees, Committee on Professional Ethics and Committee on Standards of Attorney Conduct. So uh, welcome, uh, Brenda. And last but not least is Mindy Sanchez, who is a personal and good friend of mine. I met Mindy the first day um, of law school, and we've been tight friends ever since. And you know, if you know how old we are, it's a long time ago. Uh, she's a proud graduate of New York University and SUNY Buffalo School of Law, where she received her Juris Doctorate. She started her legal career as an assistant assistant district attorney, uh, where she worked for approximately six years in the Bronx. Um, she tried a whole bunch of different cases in narcotics, robbery, and homicide. And then when she relocated to Charlotte, North Carolina, she was a professor for seven years, instructing on criminal law, criminal procedure, trial practice, evidence, and human trafficking. And then she currently works as the Senior Associate General Counsel for the Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education, which is the 18th largest school district nationwide, not just in North Carolina, where she specializes in labor and employment law. So please welcome all three of our wonderful panelists. What I want you to do now is, just like I talked a little bit uh, about girls' rule and what we do, I want you to tell us what your elevator pitch is. That's one of the things that we teach the girls when we do etiquette, when we're talking about interviews. You know, And I always say that if I was to run into Michelle Obama or Oprah Winfrey in an elevator, what exactly would I tell them, right? That would help them to remember me and remember girls' rule the law. So. Let's start with Winnie. If you were to run into Michelle Obama or Oprah in an elevator, um, tell us what it is that would be your elevator pitch. Winnie. Oh my goodness. I think uh, I would just be like a cartoon number one. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, I, I, there was no, nothing that made sense would come out if I actually ran into them in an elevator. Um, first, I just want to thank you, Myrna, for inviting me to be a part of today's program and just send greetings to um, my co-panelists today. It's been so great getting to know them, Brenda and uh, Mindy. And um, my elevator pitch is um, that, uh, hi, uh, my name is Edwina Martin and uh, I am an attorney. If it was Michelle Obama, I'd say, like you are. Um, and we have a similar background starting off in the private sector, but moving on to nonprofit and government. Um, I specialized in um, public policy and program development, as well as strategic um, management, um, development, and uh, strategic communications. And uh, I run a city agency currently where uh, we oversee certain types of states. Um, and we do something unique that you don't find in the other boroughs or counties in New York State. And that is we make sure that no one from Staten Island, my borough, ends up in Pauper's Field. Um, they are buried with dignity and respect on Staten Island, regardless of funds. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Brenda, your elevator pitch. Yes, uh, I would also like to say thank you, Marina for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege and um, um, looking forward to, to this discussion. So I think, yeah, after I squeal or just be stunned into silence, I think I would, I would say <laughs> hi, I'm Brenda Dorsett Bowling. I am a problem solver. I assist attorneys, profession, um, attorneys, um, accountants, and other professionals when they make an error or an omission. I investigate, I ask questions, I ask tough questions, I ask questions that sometimes people don't like to answer or don't feel are appropriate, but it is essential that I dig deeper and get those answers to those questions. 
I then synthesize all the information that I've obtained and I present it to um, the folks that need to know the information. I analyze the information and then try to come up with a solution um, that is agreeable, not only to the person who has uh, been the victim of the error, but to the professional who has made the error. I'm a per people person at heart. Um, I love talking to people. I love getting to know people. And um, I'm an attorney by background, but I enjoy doing many other things. Thank you, Brenda. And Mindy, your elevator pitch. Um, so I, I too want to um, express my gratitude for being included. It is an honor to be with such amazing, powerful women. Uh, Winnie, it's great to meet you. Uh, Brenda and I have also known each other many, many years. I won't out either of you, but it's 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 in the high double digits. Um, and my dear friend Myrna, I am uh, very proud of you and I'm very happy to be included in this group. Um, so I too would be pretty tongue-tied if I read into uh, Michelle Obama, but um, my pitch would go something like this. Um, my name is Mindy Sanchez. I am the proud daughter of South American immigrants who has spent the majority of my legal career of 25 plus years being of service to the public and to my community. Um, I started my well-rounded career with uh, my tenure at the Bronx District Attorney's Office where I proudly served for almost six years. Um, I then transitioned into becoming an in-house counsel and claims manager for an international insurance company. And shortly after my relocation to Charlotte, I became a law professor where I used my expertise, my skills in litigation and advocacy to train a future generation of lawyers. Um, and I continue to serve the pu public sector and impact change as a senior associate general counsel for Charlotte Mecklenburg School District the 18th largest in the country, where I utilize my exceptional litigation skills in the areas of labor and employment law. And then I would have to say, and I really, really love you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Min. Um, so that was great. Thank you for showing us what an elevator pitch looks like. And now before we get into the meat of, of the presentation, which is about time management, I want to go back to you, Winnie, and ask you to tell us something that you don't do professionally, something that's fun that maybe your friends and family know about you, but that people in the professional world don't. Uh, so I am a crafter. Um, I sew and I crochet. Um, and I sometimes design things, um, not that often, usually use patterns, but once in a while. And um, so I make clothing and um, home decor. Thank you. Okay, Brenda. Well, when I was in college, I was an FCC licensed DJ on the campus radio station. And it was the campus station, but it was broadcast throughout the Binghamton area. Um, and I still enjoy music. I like DJing in my own home. And um, I, I love music, all different types of music. And interesting fact, um, the radio station is where I met my husband all those many years ago. We were both apprentices learning how to become um, DJs. I did not know you. Thank you, I didn't know you knew today. Um, Mindy? I didn't know that either about Brenda, and I've known you so many years. Wow, that's interesting. Um, so, you know, as a, as a growing up in a Latin household, music and dancing has always been a very significant part of my culture, my life. So I have loved to dance. You know, I love dancing since I was little. So several years ago, um, I, um, after taking many, many, many years of Zumba, I became certified as a Zumba instructor. <laughs> I have only taught one class because I don't have time, but um, I do have my certification on my desk that I'm a certified Zumba teacher. So love it, love it, <laughs> and I can see that. I, I can see you teaching a Zumba class, man. <laughs> So I think we are all of the generation that constantly saw a commercial, maybe not so much the, the young ladies who are on, but at least for us who are the panelists here, there was a commercial, it was, it was for a perfume, I'm not going to out them, but it was about this woman and, you know, she, I, you know, I referenced it at the beginning about how you know, she, it was like, a, it was themed like a blues uh, commercial and it was like, I bring home the bacon, right? And, <laughs> and she fries it up in a pan and then she's like, 
like in this suit and then she's coming home and she's in her kitchen and she's making this gourmet meal and then she's in in evening wear and she's dancing with her husband and then it, it ends with her being in bed with this adorable little boy and she's reading him a bedtime story and it was really the message was that this woman it was a superwoman right that she could do everything she she was this woman and if you just got the perfume that she was wearing you could be that woman as well um, which I mean, seriously. So what do you think of, of these types of messages, um, Winnie? Because it's not just us that are that see it. I think we see it. We still see it in, in commercials and in media today. So what are you thinking of those messages? And what do they tell the girls that are watching them about their place in the world? Let's start with you, Winnie. Yeah, so thanks, um, Myrna. And yes, those types of commercials are so gendered. And while they're not quite as as in your face as that old one, you still see them. I look at them and I get so annoyed um, all the time when I see them on TV. It is, um, it's unrealistic. It is um, gendered, trying to put you into some sort of silo. And um, my message to you is that you do not have to be in a silo, that um, the oh, no one has it all, number one. Everything is about making choices and prioritizing what's most important to you and letting go of, of what isn't. Um, and so um, that involves having a support system, building a support system, um, having friends and family close by, um, and your friend, you can have your family that you're born into and you can have the family that you create as well, um, and they are just as important. And it's about having a support system and prioritizing what's important to you and, and trying to tune out sort of the messages about what you should be doing um, as a woman, as a young woman, as a woman of color, because those are all false messages from people trying to sell you things and keep you in some sort of little silo um, instead of flying free as a bird and, and trying and doing what works best for you. So I'll stop there. Okay. Um, Brenda, what about you? I, I have to think that those commercials were damaging, I thought, for us growing up, but some of the commercials now and some of these reality show um, things now are just as bad. So um, what do you think about the message that is being sent to girls from then through now? Well, I think the overall message that's being sent, it's, it's, it's not a good message um, because the message is that you have to be all things to everyone and that you have to be perfect and that you have to be superwoman. Mm -hmm. um, that commercial, mm -hmm. I remember the, the, the song, the ditty, I remember running around the house singing it, not even realizing you know, what it signified. Um, but mm -hmm. it was that you can do everything and that if you didn't have everything, you didn't have all those parts, you didn't have the job where you were bringing home the bacon, bringing home the money, if you didn't have the partner that you could let know they were a man, if you didn't have the children that you could read the story to that somehow you weren't, uh, you weren't successful or you weren't complete. Um, so that message alone, I think that part of it is, is, was, is damaging. Um, and today there's still the message of perfection, that everything has to be perfect. Everything we see is through a filtered lens of, of everyone with bodies that are perfect because they're not natural bodies. Um, and, and those things, the commercial and what it represented is something that you can get on a wheel and spin yourself to the point where you don't even know who you are. And it's so important to figure out for yourself what is important to you and what success is to you because it means different things to different people and to figure that out for yourself and sort of, you know, tune out those external messages that really can lead you to feel incomplete. And, and, and that's not the message um, that we want for our generation or for the younger generations to come. So I'm glad that that commercial is no longer on the air. Thanks, Brenda. Mindy, what about you? 
Um, I, I think that message is really dangerous um, for girls and for women alike. Um, you know, we don't have that commercial anymore, but we now have a much more complex society where, you know, women are not only made to feel badly about not, ha not having it all or doing it all, but not looking the part, right? Not having all those posts on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, and, you know, not having enough likes and not, you know, having enough pictures and, you know, trying new experiences. It's just, it's just a mess, really. Um, but, you know, being able to do it all perfectly all of the time is a complete myth. Um, and I think that perpetuating that myth creates a lot of insecurity and self-doubt in women when they realize they can't do it all. It's just impossible. Um, and, you know, Winnie, I agree with you. It's so gender based because men have never been held to this standard. Right. You've never heard of a man being able to do it all. You know, we we applaud men, men for getting up and going to work, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, you know, so I think that the message that we really need to perpetuate to to all women and, and girls, especially women of color who you know, always feel, you know, at least I, you know, I know me and close friends, we've always felt you have to kind of prove yourself 10 more times, right, than anyone else. Um, make time for your priorities, make time for what you really want to get accomplished. And as Elsa said in Frozen, let it go, right? Let the rest of it go. Thank you, man. So I was fortunate enough early on in my career, um, I went to school up in Buffalo and, and I ended up moving down back to New York City uh, two years into my career. And I was doing you know the, the rounds and trying to meet people. And I went to a CLE at the New York City Bar Association on work-life balance of all things. And one panelist was a, a partner at a big law firm. And the, po uh, the question posed to her was, how do you make time to do it all? And I was really impressed because her response was, and I will never forget that, was, I don't, right? Um, and then she went on to explain that she had a lot of help and that she has to prioritize day to day. So she has gotten into the habit of saying, what does success mean to me today, right? So that's that's the, the title of the presentation because she had to take it day by day. And she said, you know, if she has a brief that needs to be done, that means a nanny has to put her kids to bed. Um, if she has to go to a recital for her kids, that means that she's not looking at that contract for the third time and may miss something. So she, you know, she's like, if if something happens to her kid, she has to get to the school, then she has to reschedule her meetings with the vendor or the or the senior partners. So she actually was very honest about it and just said, I don't do it all, I, and I'm not. I refuse to beat myself up over the fact that I can't do it all. So her honesty to me was extremely refreshing. So all of you are professional women, high powered women. So um, my question to you is, how do you prioritize balance in your life? So Mindy, we already have you on the screen. So we'll start with you and, and go backwards. Okay. Um, yeah. So for me, achieving balance has always been my top priority. And, you know, even when I first graduated law school, I, I've navigated my entire career away from the law firm life, because I have, um, my understanding is that there really is no balance, right? When you're working for, you know, a large law firm. So I've navigated my career so that I can continue to achieve balance. That by no means indicates that, you know, the career I've had has been any less challenging or, you know, less time consuming. Um, but for me personally, I know that if I feel burnt out in any one area of my life, it will impact all the areas of my life. And so I have to be very, cognizant that I don't allow myself to get to that point. Um, and, you know, at this point in my life, I have built up the confidence level to the point where I can set boundaries, right? Because it's so important that you set boundaries in your life. Um, and so I've set those boundaries at work. I've set them at home so I don't reach that burnout mode. And I'm not successful at creating boundaries all the time, but I am successful most of the time. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think in general, you know, to create that balance, one, you do have to make it a priority, right? Two, you have to embrace the power of no. You have to learn how to say no to things that are not as important to you, you know? And so, you know, prioritizing what you want to accomplish, the goals you want to achieve, and really what matters to you, right? What, what, your, 
what your heart tells you, you know, is important to you. Those are the things that you need to really have in the, in the, in the front of your mind. Brenda? Yes. Um, early on in my, I think it was my first um, legal job, and um, one of my, uh, my coworkers, who's still a good friend, we would always have these um, deep philosophical conversations about life and, and, and families and friends and relationships and, and, and work and careers. And I remember one day she shared with me um, the story about the five balls and juggling the five balls. And I now know the background of the five balls. It, it, it was actually um, part of a commencement speech given by um, a former CEO of Coca-Cola. Um, but what he said to the graduates was, imagine your life as consisting of five balls. And the five balls would be your work, your family, your friends, your health, and your spirit. And juggling all those balls constantly. And you realize as you go through the years that the work career job ball will be is a rubber ball, meaning that if it drops when you're juggling everything, it bounces back. And the other four balls, your health, your family, your friends, your spirit, your spirituality, those things are made of glass, they're glass balls. And if they fall, they break, and they become either irre irre irreparable or they're very damaged. So the point of his message was basically prioritize balance in your life. And that always stuck with me because at that time, early in my career, I wanted to make a mark and work and work. And then sometimes you sacrifice your friends or the rela relationships and realizing that no, you really can't, You you have to, prioritize those friends, your health, your family, your spirituality. Um, and I saw it firsthand. I was laid off a few years into my career and I had those relationships. I was able to keep going because those other balls, the glass balls, I, I juggled them and I had the support that I needed. And then of course the job bounced back. It bounced back even better than what it was before, so it was a good lesson. But how I prioritize um, the, the balance in my life is sometimes I learn now that I have to say no, as Mindy mentioned. Um, I was asked to be a part of, I was nominated to be on a, a bar association committee and it would have been a good committee. I, I would have enjoyed participating, but I had just recently moved out of New York City and I had to rely on commuter, a commuter rail to get home. So that, and the meetings were held in the evenings after work. So if I missed my train by three seconds, that was the difference in getting home an hour later. And I realized that mm -hmm. an hour later would mean I may not get to see my children that day. It may mean that I'm more exhausted, I'm more anxious, I'm more stressed. And when I would did finally get home, I would have to start all over again the next morning, regular time. So I realized that that wasn't the best situation for me. So learning to say no is one of the ways that I prioritize balance. And of course, learning to delegate and, and realizing what's important so that you can figure out how to balance everything, figuring out what's important to you, not just what other people may think are important for you. Thank you. Winnie? Um, uh, so it's interesting coming after two people who talk about the importance of saying no, uh, cause I think too often I'm like, you know, Annie in Oklahoma and I'm just the girl that can't say no. <laughs> so I'm still learning that lesson. <laughs> um, but, uh, when I, um, made the transition from private practice to the um, nonprofit sector um, at the program I was with, which was a legal services nonprofit, uh, used to have monthly sessions on um, things like work-life balance, on things to help make our lives better as professionals and just as people. 
Um, and one of the best sessions, and at this point, close to 20 years ago, but I remember it like yesterday, um, was about organizing and prioritizing the things that you need to do in life. Um, and she gave this very simple piece of advice that made a huge difference to me, which is that um, I'm very much into lists. When you create, when you think about the things you need to accomplish at that time, for example, I was building a website for the program I was in. Um, so you think about the things that you need to accomplish um, and your to-do list and your tasks but you do it for everything in your life, for paying your bills, for your grocery shopping, for going to the bank before everything was, was easier to do um, via your phone or you know, your computer and, um, make, and put them into one list and then prioritize that list so that you get the things done that you need to in your personal life as well as your professional life. And you decide the things that can wait till next week and the things that absolutely have to be done in order to keep the lights on, <laughs> in order to make sure you get everything to your website designer in time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an approach that I use up until this day. Um, and it's really helped me in juggling many different things, but also keeping my eyes on the prize for what the end result is, what your goal is, or what your vision is, um, both in your work life and in your personal life. Um, so so that, that was a great lesson for me. So what, would you say that's your formula for success, um, Winnie? Uh, I would say that that is part of my um, formula for success. Um, I don't think there is a formula for success because what is success? I think that success is different things to different people. For some people, success is making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for others, it, it could be being the best parent you could be. So being home more often. Um, so I think that you have to decide internally, not externally, not looking at gendered messages, mm -hmm. saying what women should be doing or shouldn't be doing, et cetera, et cetera. But what really makes you happy and what's most important to you. And I think when you have sort of that settled in your head and in your heart, then the formula will come from that. So I, I don't think there is any formula. I think that there, everybody has the, the things and the processes that work best for them for the things that are most important to them. Um, and I'll just add, and I know we're supposed to be really quick, but when I was in law school, and it probably hasn't, which is a long time ago, but it probably hasn't changed that much. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of people were very focused on making a lot of money coming out of law school. Um, I got very caught up in that. Um, I also had, um, you know, debts to pay the student, you know, the student loans, and, which were very much on my mind. Um, and I can tell you that using that external criteria um, did not make me a happy person. Um, it was only when I stepped back and looked inward and thought about the things that brought me the most personal satisfaction. And for me, it was trying to help to make the world a better place um, that, that I became uh, a happier lawyer and you know, was able to really sort of move myself into doing things that brought me more personal satisfaction. Thanks, Winnie. Um, Brenda, what would you say is your formula for success? Uh, my formula for success, for success is recognizing um, my journey and recognizing what is for me on my journey. Um, and that's important because you, you don't want to be consumed by what other people think you should be doing or where you should be at certain points in your, in your career. So I've, I've gotten comfortable with seeing what is my path and learning what is my path and 
moving forward with that and re recognizing that today it'll be for me tomorrow or it will be for me whenever it is meant to be for me. Um, and I, I remember one time I was um, at a job and a coworker thought she was maybe helping me or sort of commiserating with me because certain people had gotten promoted and she was saying, oh, you've been here so long and you haven't been promoted. And, and I guess wanting me to sort of get, you know, angry. Yeah, you're right. And, but I said, look, you know, I'm, I'm going to do what I have to do. And when, when it's for me, it, it'll happen. Um, with that being said, I believe that preparation is, is key. Mm -hmm. And when I say preparation, I don't just mean preparing if you have a meeting or a presentation coming up to prepare in advance, but also just preparing for what may come in the future. And by that, I mean, if you need to take some courses that you're interested in, you can do things now online. Um, there are free courses that you can take. I, I sometimes take webinars um, offered by law firms and, and I get continuing education credit for it. And, and just to learn a field um, or an area of the law that I'm not familiar with, or just to learn more about something. So I, I feel that um, lifelong learning and a love of learning is also um, one of the tenets of, of my success. And I'm also a positive person. I really try to see the, the bright side in everything, even when I've had setbacks, I try to look back mm -hmm. and see the lesson and, and to learn from that lesson. Um, and it, it's not always easy to do, but um, it, it's something that I, I've, I've, I've recognized is a strength. And um, I, I really try to encourage and use that with other people too, because um, it, it's important for everyone to sometimes realize that we all have something in us that is a strength and that we should develop those strengths. And maybe there are weaknesses, but work on developing those weaknesses rather than focusing on what you can't do or I can't do. Focus on your strengths and then try to build up um, those weaknesses. And those are things that I that I do. And I think that's um, what I would consider to, be, to, to fall into my definition of, of success. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brenda. Mindy, what would you say is your formula for success? So I, I remember many years ago when I, when I was still in law school, I read an amazing book by um, a man by the name of Les Brown, who was a very popular motivational speaker. He wrote a book called um, Purpose and Power. And one of the things he said has stuck with me for many, many years now. And he said that whatever you're doing in your life, focus 100% on it right? When you're at work, focus 100% at work. When you're at home, focus 100% at home. When you're with your children, focus 100% on them. Um, and, you know, after many years of being in this practice and moving and, you know, just everything that life throws at you, I realized that, you know, for me, my definition of success is, is really feeling joy as much as I can, right? Feeling joy in every moment. And the way that I realize I feel joy is by being present. Um, you know, really identifying and prioritizing what's truly important to me and focusing 100% on what I'm doing, right? Because, you know, when I'm at home with my kids, I don't want to think about work because it robs me of the present moment. It robs me of the joy that I get to feel with my children. And when I'm at work, I need, you know, I enjoy my work and I enjoy speaking to people, you know, I'm a people person. I, I love, you know, the, the part of my job where I get to talk to different people, you know, in different departments. And um, I throw myself into my work, you know, and my kids and my family and everything else, it kind of stays in the back of my mind. So um, for me, I think one of the formulas of my success has really to try to remain in the present moment at all times. Um, and I think that another thing is I'm not afraid to ask for help. You know, I think as women, we need to shift our mind about having it all or more accurately doing it all. And from being the sole purveyors of all tasks to being co-owners or in partnership with others, right? Whether it's your spouse, your partner at home, your colleagues at work, other parents in the carpool lane, there's no shame in creating a village for assistance, right? So you can have the proper balance in your life. 
And I think the last thing that I have really been trying to practice consistently every day, which I feel is part of my success is gratitude. You know, no matter what situation you're in or where life takes you, um, there is always gratitude to be felt and to be had for what you have in the moment. And so, you know, expressing that gratitude, um, you know, for my you know, myself, my family, my community, my village, my health, you know, that puts me in a really good mind space to go out and, and, and be successful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so Winnie, I'm going to pivot back to you because you are easily the busiest person, uh, you know, man, woman, child, I know. Um, and Tanya, I don't know if you're still listening, but if you could put up that slide with uh, Winnie's signature block, um, that would be great. Um, there we go. That's <laughs> so on my screen is a picture of your signature block. So you were in leadership at the New York State Bar Association when I joined in 2008, um, and you are still going strong. You are one of the co-chairs of the Committee on Leadership Development, among so many other things. You are the commissioner and public administrator for a county. You are on a, a board with me as well. Seriously, though, I mean, what is your tried and true management tip to all of us um, for, for doing <laughs> Oh my God. Um, I, I feel like my face is turning red. <laughs> uh, so, um, one of them I mentioned earlier, which really is doing that sort of integrated list of like sort of the things you have to do. But, um, it, if I ever write a book, um, the title, the working title is something along the lines of everything um, I need to know I learned from crafting. Um, I started sewing and crocheting in elementary school um, and sewing I learned from watching my mother and grandmother and aunts. Um, crocheting, um, I just, uh, one day I woke up and I, I don't know why this came into my head, but I told my mother that uh, I wanted to crochet um, hat and mittens. Uh, and a scarf for the winter. And she took me to the store and brought me a how to crochet pattern and the, the rest is history. Um, and the reason that I say that is that from crafting, you learn how to break things down into pieces and to understand how those pieces work into the whole. And um, just as with my integrated lists, um, that is really how I approach most things, not just tasks and things that I need to do in my job or at home, but also my goal setting. Um, you know, and I'll give an example. Um, I knew that I wanted to become more involved in local government, but um, I didn't come from you know some family that was deeply entrenched uh, and you find a lot of that in New York. Um, I didn't know much about um, the county committee that I wanted to become involved with, which, which was the Democratic County Committee. Um, and so um, I started asking people I knew who were involved um, and it and I sort of created a plan. you know I volunteered. Um, I did petitions for candidates and put myself in pl places and positions where people who make those decisions would, would see what I'm doing and know who I am. That doesn't like just happen. I mean, sometimes it can, but you know, for what you want in life, when you decide that you have to break down the pieces um, to figure out who do I need to reach? What do I need to do to reach them? Um, how can I reach them in a way that's meaningful? And it was by, you know, sort of breaking that into pieces and thinking about what each one was and learning what each one was that I was able to get appointed to the county committee um, that I got to know my local council person um, so that when she had a position open, 
Um, I called her and said, you know, I really would love to be your legislative director. Um, and I wasn't a stranger out of nowhere or um, someone she had met just once. By that point, you know, we knew each other. We had met, you know, at county events. You know, I went to their holiday parties. I supported the organization. Um, and so that when that opportunity came, I was able to, you know, give her my resume and meet with her and get what was my dream job. Um, so uh, I can't talk enough about how amazing crafting is and all of the life lessons that you learn from that. Um, but I, I will stop there with that example. <laughs> Thanks, Winnie. Um, so Brenda, you are a fellow working mom, which to me has been the hardest challenge of my career. Um, referring back to the sort of I don't response to, you know, that, that, that so by all accounts, right, a very successful woman, a partner at a big law firm said um, to how do you do it all? I know I definitely could not do it all. Several times in my career, I've had to roll back my legal career because I wanted to put my kid on the bus in the morning and take him off the bus at night. Or I wanted to read him that bedtime story or go see a basketball game. Um, you know, these past couple of days, he got injured at a basketball game. So I, I've been mom, right, like making him comfort food and that sort of stuff. And I know that when I went back to work full time, I had to rely heavily on my village, whether, you know, that was my mother pitching in, um, his dad, you know, taking time off to help with him. I remember my sister having to drive an hour to go with Brendan to a mommy and me event because I was working. So, um, so what's as claims officer, lawyer, mom, what is, what do, what do you do to make sure that it all gets done? Yeah, so I, I I must admit when I when I shared with my husband that I was um, going to be on this panel and uh, the topic was overall time management, he looked at me and he laughed. And he's 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 a nice guy. He's not a hater, but what he realized is that I'm constantly constantly reading books, um, watching webinars, um, listening to other people's tips on how to manage my time, how to make my life easier, how to work, work smarter and not harder. So I'm constantly, constantly, and maybe to him, it, it doesn't seem that I would know about time management, but I, I have the mindset that I can always develop and get better. Um, so I, I, that's what I do. I've, I've learned and I'm still learning how to manage my time and how to manage and balance all those roles because all those roles are very important. I can't completely shut out work because I need to provide and contribute and there are things we want to do. So I need the income, but I also want my children to know me. I want my husband to have a wife. Um, so some, some tried and true tips, um, I'll start with work. Um, what I've, I've done some, when I have to do um, any out of routine projects. So for example, if I have to write a report or I have to prepare for a meeting, um, what I'll do is just simply turn off the volume on my computer, close my email, um, so that where I'm not seeing the constant emails that are coming through and be tempted to respond in real time. Um, so mm -hmm. what I will do is I'll then set a block of time and then either in an hour or two hours, give myself 10, 15 minutes to go through and respond or check those emails. And in keeping with that block of reviewing the emails, I've discovered the flag function on the, on the email. And basically you click it and it tells you to follow up. It gives you dates when you can follow up. You can do it tomorrow, later today, you can set a time. And it's great because it also highlight it, highlights it for you so that you don't forget. And, and I think that's important because sometimes when you have to really focus um, and, and you think a little small interruption, you'll say, oh, I'll just respond quickly to this email. It's a quick response. But then boom, the person asks a follow-up question. And then before you know it, 
you're 10 minutes distracted from what you were planning to do. So, so that helps me. Um, that that has been something that I've implemented, and and some people may not like it because they want a quick. We're in the society now where it's immediate response. Um, but you know, a, a one to two hour window, you know, within your schedule, I think I think that's that's reasonable, and it's worked for me. Um, and also, um, I I I'm on so I'm on committees. I do volunteer work, and sometimes. I don't have the time in the regular day to get things done. So sometimes it means that I do have to wake up early in the morning. I've recognized now that I always thought I was a night owl. I can stay up at night and I used to brag. I can stay up and then get up and be functioning the next day. No, no, no. It doesn't really work that way anymore because I realize that my the time when I can get the most done in the shortest amount of time is very early in the morning before anyone else wakes up. I can write something in 30 minutes that in the busy part of the day would have taken two hours. So recognizing that, and that means if I'm getting up early, it means I have to go to bed. <laughs> so recognizing getting that bed, going to bed and not feeling that I'm missing out on whatever it is that I think I'm missing out on if I don't go to sleep. but um, it getting up and doing that early time reviewing if I have a meeting reviewing whatever materials we're going to be discussing because I, I want to be prepared um, and and sometimes you realize you do have to put in that extra time but also recognizing it's not a constant thing so you don't want this to be what you're doing all the time but realize okay I have this meeting tomorrow I want to be prepared I'm going to get up I'm going to write I'm going to do what I have to do. I have this deadline to submit something. I'm going to do it, get put in that extra time. Um, and also delegating. Um, it's something that I've never found easy to do, but I realize that um, there are things that other people can do just as well. Um, and it doesn't have to be me to do it. Um, and going into home life, delegating has been important. Um, I read a book. It's um, by... Um, and a woman, her name is Tiffany Dufu, and it's called Drop the Ball. And she said something in, in there that just clicked for me, especially for working women. Um, it's basically, is what you're doing the highest and best use of your time? And are you doing something that only you can do? Or are you doing something that anybody can do? And that really helped me because I had an obsession with, I must do my children's laundry. Why? Why did I have to do the laundry? Why can't my husband do it? Why can't the babies? Why can't I need it to? No, that's not the best use of my time. The best use of my time would be sitting with them, reading, going to their classroom, reading, or volunteering at their school so that they can see my presence there. That would be the best use of my time. And, and so realizing that and, and sort of as, as, as Mindy said initially, letting go, letting go that okay, I, I, I want to do something, but I can't, I can't do everything. And realizing, okay, what is the best use of my time at work? Is the best use of my time filling out the green return receipts, which I used to do. We had uh, people that would do, I would do it because, oh, it's just faster. I would do it. Why? You, you know, and it's, it's learning that and recognizing, but it, 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 takes, it takes time. And those are things that I've, I've done that I've found have allowed me to be calmer at home because I'm not stressed out. I'm doing things and doing activities that I feel are benefiting me as the whole, benefiting my community. And I'm also making time. I also make dinner on Sunday nights. I'll make two to three dinners. So that way for the week. And then the other days we kind of figure it out, but I, I can't cook every night because I'm not a natural cooker. So it takes a lot of time for me to prepare a meal. I can't just throw it together the way my mom, I'm amazed. How did you do that? And it tasted so good. Um, but it's it's recognizing and, and learning those things. So on Sundays, I'll cook meals for at least two or three days because that helps us out during the week. So those are some of the tried and true things that I've, I've done and discovered that help me to, you know, <laughs> keep 
keep those balls going. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brenda. Um, and Min, this is the reason, you know, the, the following question is the reason really that, uh, that I asked you to be on this panel. Because I remember, like I've said before, and you've said, we have been friends for, you know, it seems like forever. Um, and when I first had Brendan all those years ago, I was, you know, I was commuting. I had just moved upstate, kind of upstate-ish, Putnam County, um, commuting two and a half hours each way, five hours a day, not sleeping at night with a toddler, and just frustrated and frazzled. And I remember going to you and complaining and saying, because um, you know me, that I, I'm a perfectionist. I'm sort of this all or nothing type person. And if I can't give something 100%, I'd rather not do it. And I remember going to you and saying, I don't have enough hours in the day to get everything perfectly right. And your response is the reason you're on this panel, which is, you know, you turned to me and gave me a little bit of tough love. And you said, things don't have to be done perfectly. They just have to get done. So you know, give us some of your tips, because I think you are one of the most efficient women that I have ever met in my life. Oh, my God. Well, that's that's a lot to live up to, Myrna. But uh, it's interesting that you remember me saying that, because my first tip, of course, as you know, is going to be let go of the perfection because it does not exist. So you can't achieve it. Right. Um, instead, I take a very practical approach to getting things done. Um, I am a very big list girl, right? I'm a woman with lists all over the place. Um, I like to visualize my goals on paper. I feel like they come to fruition much faster. And for me, you know, there's nothing more satisfying than putting that check mark next to a goal on your list once you've completed it. Um, but the key, right, is really to set attainable goals because if the list is too ambitious, it's useless, right? Um, and you don't want to set yourself up for failure. You want to set yourself up for success. So um, having said that, though, do not beat yourself up if you haven't completed everything on the list, right? Because if you have too much on the list, you have still not embraced the power of saying no. <laughs> and, and we really have to embrace that. You know, I think all of us have a little bit of that, you know, FOMO. Is that what, is that what everybody calls it? Fear of missing out? Yeah, I, I have, you know, the fear of not resting enough, right? So I'm fine with, with FOMO. Um, but, you know, earlier in my life, I really bought into that myth, right? That that woman in the commercial did that I can do it all. You know, I wanted to be the perfect mom and the perfect employee. And, you know, um, I wanted to keep my house spotless in case Home and Garden ever came to visit me at but, you know, then I realized I'm not a superhero, right? I don't see any cape on my back. So I had to start saying no to a lot of things to, you know, and it freed up my time to actually do things that I enjoyed doing. And that's my last tip is you have to have some fun along the way, right? Mm -hmm. You know, life is short, but it's also really long. Yeah. And, you know, the journey is really not pleasant if you're not having fun. So... You know, for me, I know that I'm not I'm not productive at all when I'm stressed out or burnt out. So my joy, right, my time is when I exercise. You know, I know some people find that to be a chore. I, it's my me time. It makes me feel good. It brings me joy. When I do my Zoom, I feel like J Lo. You know, twerking in front of the front of the class. Um, <laughs> that's probably too much information, but you know, make time for yourself, whatever brings you joy, right? Vacations, long weekends, you know, physical activity, you know, binge watching Netflix if you need to, but whatever you need to keep yourself grounded and joyful. And that should be one of your top priorities. Thanks. Look, oh yeah. So, all right, we have just a few minutes left and I do want to leave a few uh, minutes for questions. So I'm going to give you my famous time machine question that I ask all of my panelists. Knowing what you know today, if you could go back in time to the time that you were 13, I'm going to give you two ages. So the time that you were 13 and then the time you were 25, which is when most of us graduated from law school. So that's that's a huge spread right there. Um, the time that you were 13, what, what piece of advice would you give yourself and the time you were 25 and you're starting out and going out into the world? So we're going to start with you, Min, since you are on our screen. Oop, you're muted. Sorry about that. Okay, so at 13, um, 
I would have told myself to invest in stock and not Barbie dolls. But, you know, aside from that, um, I would have given myself the advice that it's okay to be different um, because I was very different. I was, you know, I guess we would call it a little odd um, and that you have to embrace those differences, not hide them. And, you know, realize that life is long and feelings that you feel, you know, feelings of happiness, sadness, not being enough, not being pretty enough, smart enough, that, that's all eventually going to fade. Um, and don't be someone else just to please other people, right? Be, don't be a yes girl. Um, you know, and I say that to my 14 year old son, I'm like, you know, whatever you're feeling it, you'll get over it. He's like, but I feel it now. <laughs> Tomorrow's another day. At 25, um, I would say have confidence and faith in yourself, right? Um, realize that if someone is not treating you well or with respect, it's not about you, it's about them. You know, it took me a long time to get that because we take that very personally. But now I say, you know, love and light to you. And, and actually my dear friend Myrna taught me that. And that love and light, right? Um, let go of the guilt that's associated with taking time out for yourself. Let go of that FOMO um, and embark on a strategy of practicing self-care, right? Um, I need to nurture my physical and well-being on a consistent basis. Um, and because I realize that if I'm going to care for everybody around me, you know, I mean, my village, all they rely on me and I'm a family of all boys, right? It's all testosterone in my house. And um, I can't take care of them if I'm not taking care of myself. So, um, you know, and that advice becomes more and more significant to me and crucial as I get older and my responsibilities grow. So, you know, it's, it's just as important now at, you know, whatever age we are now, as it was at 25. Thank you, man. Brenda? At, at 13, I would tell myself, um, it's okay not to fit in. Um, it's okay to be you. Um, your people will find you and you will find your people. And it's okay not to fit in or not to have um, people want to be with you. And also, I would say, don't wait for people to come to you sometimes. You can go and approach people. I was very shy. And some, I would wait for people to ask me, do you want to play? Do you want to do this? I was never sort of the initiator. So I think, and I would say, it's okay. It's okay if, if, if you don't fit in. Um, it's okay to be by yourself. Um, it's okay to spend time, you know, doing what you enjoy doing um, and not worrying about fitting in. Um, so that would, that would be what I would tell my 13-year-old self. Um, my 25-year-old self, I would say, um, believe in yourself more. Um, you know your stuff, you knew your stuff. Um, you may not have always been the most vocal, but just because you weren't the most vocal that didn't mean that you didn't know what you knew and to have confidence in that. Um, and if things didn't go the way that you wanted them to go, it, 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 it wouldn't be the end of the world that you could, you could still push through and be resilient. And, and that things, things would work out. Everything, everything would work out. So that, that I think is the overall message. Everything works out the way it should. Thanks, Brenda. <laughs> you will be uh, our last person and our last answer before we go into the question that I see pending. Um, I would say a lot of the same things uh, at 13 and at 25, um, which is, a treat, approach life like it's an adventure. Um, don't over plan, uh, keep an open mind and don't let fear rule your decisions um, and the things you decide to do. Um, the thing that I would add when I, <laughs> to the 25 year old me, however, in addition to all of that is take care of yourself. And of course, it's always important to eat healthy and um, get enough rest and everything. But I mean, just like sort of physically, you know, when you pull that muscle or, you know, you, you have those little accidents, um, don't ignore them. 
um, you know, because they actually come back <laughs> to cause arthritis and all sorts of other things. And so I know it's hard. Um, you know, most of you are like around 13, 14, right? So it's hard to think about, um, you know, what, what your physical condition could be when you're 50 years old. But, but those little things will come back and make a huge difference. And if you take care of them when they happen, that's less likely to happen. So that's just a practical piece of advice. <laughs> we have a question and I do want to be mindful of everybody's time, but I think it's a really good question. And if one of you ladies would volunteer to take it, it would be great. Um, but this uh, one of our attendees says, how do you prioritize what matters to you and what you want to achieve if you still have to pay bills and work to make a living? Um, which makes sense, right? Because it does sound, of course, we are speaking from, you know, 25, 26, 30 years after school is finished, as opposed to you're getting right out and now you have to um, earn a living. So, um, Winnie, I don't know if you want to take a crack at it. Um, yep. Yeah, so, so that's where, you know, sort of the crafting mentality of making those plans and setting things in place um, in long term come in. Um, you might be in a job that's miserable, but that you need in order to pay the bills. Um, but you, um, if, if you want to move on from that situation to something that's more satisfying, you have to somehow sort of find the time to think about what those steps should be. And there's an exercise you can do, which I found really, really helpful when I wanted to make a change in my career. I sat down, um, and this wasn't easy because it's never easy to admit failure to yourself, mm -hmm. but you actually need to sit down and sort of make the list of your successes, things you think you've done well, and things where, you know, times where you failed or you don't think you did your best. Um, and also sort of make lists of what are the tasks that you enjoy doing and what do you hate doing? Um, and then you sort of align um, your successes and what you enjoy doing. And you can start to make a plan to do something that involves more of those things. And I will give the example. I was a litigator mm -hmm. um, and I really didn't enjoy it because it didn't suit my personality. Um, I also wasn't very motivated. Um, and I, you know, I, I know there are times when I'm, I'm like, wow, I wish that I could be more motivated by money. But um, like money is the bottom line for me was never enough. Um, and that's part of why I didn't enjoy being in law firms because I didn't always enjoy the tasks and I wasn't highly motivated personally and internally by what the end result was and what you were working towards. Um, and so I sort of sat down and I made those lists of things I felt I did well, things I thought I did poorly or failed um, and the tasks that I actually enjoyed doing and that helped me realize that um, I should be doing more transactional things um, like communications and government relations, and that I needed to move myself into the, the public and the government sectors where the um, bottom line it was more in alignment with my own personal um, sort of views and priorities. Um, and so that took a while. That took reaching out to people. It, it took sending cold calls and letters. Um, it took interviewing. Um, but I eventually got there and, and there years later and so much happier. Thank you so much, um, Winnie. And with that, I think uh, I don't see any other open questions. Thank you, um, Amy and, and the other ladies and, and young ladies who attended our program today. Thank you so much, Winnie, Mindy, 
uh, Brenda for giving up your time. Um, we know that we are all very busy and I, it, I'm so appreciative and Girls Rule the Law is so appreciative of you taking the time um, to volunteer um, for this program. Um, and with that, I'm going to, uh, I don't see anything else in the chat. Thank you. Okay, people are saying thank you and um, there was uh, so much insight. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. Here. Take care.